a warm, a warm welcome to every one of you joining from all around the world. It, it is a distinct pleasure and honor, um, again, to be with us, this time with the Strabismus and Pediatric Ophthalmology uh, or Ophthalmological Society of India. And uh, with that, I would like to, uh, as the president of the International Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Council, uh, would like to give you some updates about the IPOSC, and, and then we'll start our session. As you all know, um, IPOSC is a now a, a T6 member society um, and, and uh, representing more than 19,000 um, individuals. I would like to first and foremost uh, acknowledge our past presidents. Um, currently, our board of directors consists of uh, myself, uh, our vice president is Dr. Jan Tier de Faber from Netherlands, secretary treasurer, Dr. Giovanni Marcon from Italy. Um, our advisor board is chaired by Dr. Mohamed Jafar. Our vice chair is Victoria Sheffield uh, from USA. And these are the advisory board members, as you well know. We do have many committees that um, hundreds of, of uh, volunteers are uh, vigorously working in. Uh, but just to give you some highlight, highlights about some of the committees, the ROP committee, um, as you can see, is chaired by Dr. Paul Chen, um, had three subcommittees, um, SIBA, the Stop Infant Blindness of Africa, International Classi Classification of ROP uh, and Development Committee, and the Online ROP Education Committee. Recently, as you may know, and hope you do, uh, because the uh, amazing publications are coming out already. The ROP committee, um, the, the International Classification of ROP, uh, who has been performed by or um, got together by 34 ophthalmologists from all around the world, 17 countries, six continents, came up with this amazing new classifications. And I uh, really encourage you to read uh, the findings um, of that. Um, also, the stuff infant blindness in Africa um, has been fairly active. Uh, we have uh, founded three centers of focus, um, and, and, and as you can see, very busy slide on, on all the activities going on. And we are pleased to now announce that the Knight Stumptire Foundation had donated $685,000 um, to, to really fund the first phase of our project and, and now we are fully funded to go forward with the first phase and, and gearing to the second phase. Obviously, the, the, one of the busiest committees which brought us all together is the Training and Education Committee. And I would like to acknowledge Dr. Jason Yam and Dr. Sonal Farzavandi for all the amazing work that, that they have been doing. And with that, um, I would like to now go into the, today's session and what a pleasure to, to um, have, uh, particularly um, Dr. Singh, the president of the SPOSI, as well as a dear friend, Chris Lloyd, who will be moderating these sessions and, and I'll hand it over to them. Thank you all. It's a great pleasure to be invited to take part in this uh, symposium. And uh, our first speaker is going to be Siddharth Agrawal, um, an additional professor at King George's Medical University in Lucknow in India. He's going to talk about clinical tips for beginners. Thank you, Siddharth. Namaste. Warm greetings from the King George's Medical University, India, to everyone across the globe. Special thank you to the IPOSC, SPOSI, Professor Frank Martin, Dr. Sonal, and Dr. Jason. I would be discussing some important points for surgeons starting with pediatric cataract surgery. Paying attention to these points, preoperatively, during the surgery, and thereafter would make the management 
of cataract in pediatric patients a pleasant journey surgeons starting with pediatric cataract surgery should be well versed with the management of adult cataract and should have repaired a good number of pediatric ocular trauma cases they should perform their initial 50 surgeries under supervision initially it makes sense to select older children and to avoid comorbid conditions like microphthalmos and colobomas regarding the preoperative workup insist on a recent b scan to rule out the posterior segment involvement and plan intraocular lens implant only in older children who are older than 6 months and have normal sized eyeballs regarding the iul formula the srkt and holiday 2 work well in younger children barrett's universal is the preferred formula for older children the choice of implant should be hydrophobic acrylic there should be no shortcuts in preoperative counseling emphasizing the need for long follow ups sensitizing the patients and the parents about amblyopia and refractive correction and taking a detailed informed consent this not only ensures a satisfied family but also prevents med- many medical legal cases later now coming to the interesting part the surgery one should be extra cautious about incisions as they tend to gape in children make them longer and biplanar or triplanar these diagrams show the intended structure of a biplanar and a triplanar incision note that the inner opening and the outer opening are on different planes the side port incision should be a clean entry with an mvr blade taking care not to extend the incision while withdrawing the end chamber entry in the main incision should be made by making the blade vertical as shown in this video to make the inner lip valvular it is also suggested to make the main incision after capsular excess to ensure better chamber stability one of the most difficult steps of surgery is achieving a continuous curvilinear capsular excess of appropriate size the ccc may be done with a cystotome or a forcep the chamber should be deepened with a cohesive ovd and small centripetal pulls should be made flattening the advancing flap and regrasping after each pull is advised aim for a smaller than intended size as the ccc stretches on completion when visibility is an issue staining the capsule with tripan blue is helpful it can be seen in this video that multiple pulls are made with the utrata forcep and the capsule is regrasped each time it advances the capsular excess should be completed from outside within sometimes however a fibrotic capsule unyielding to the cystotome or the vitrectomy cutter is encountered it can be managed by slightly in- enlarging the incision use and using a vana scissor for the capsulotomy the other alternative is using an intraocular scissor after an appropriate ccc the hydro procedures and removal of the nuclear and cortical matter is usually easy often the nuclear matter flows out with an appropriate hydro dissection in small children the next difficult step is management of posterior capsule here i show posterior ccc in an opaque capsule for better visualization similar to the anterior ccc gentle centripetal pulls 
with a forcep in a well formed chamber using a cohesive ovd is helpful anterior vitrectomy should be done in younger children after the posterior capsular opening for vitrectomy i recommend using the anterior approach for beginners the vitreous may be strained with trimsinolone and liberal anterior vitrectomy should be performed a few tips about iol injection the bag should be well inflated and the leading haptic should go between the capsular rims and the trailing haptic should open in the anterior chamber or in the sulcus this is achieved by slightly withdrawing the injector and depressing it as the leading haptic unfolds the trailing haptic is then positioned into the bag with a sinski hook the beginners should be careful that the lens does not unfold vertically the first photograph here shows ideal placement of the iol within the capsular rims the second picture shows the capture of an iol in the posterior uh, capture of the iol optic in the posterior ccc with haptics placed in the bag this procedure should be gradually learned by all pediatric cataract surgeons for good long term results incisions should be sutured in children suturing under the air and observing the shape of the air bubble while tightening the knots helps to titrate the tension on the suture a small peritomy of the conjunctiva to bury the suture makes sense post operatively the eyes should be bandaged and small children should wear mittens to avoid poking into the eye all surgeons should be aware of the possibility of toxic anterior segment syndrome and intraocular infection and should have a high suspicion for them in the early post operative period it should be remembered that examination would be difficult in children post operatively and one should be skilled enough to identify these conditions early to differentiate between them and to start timely management the eye should not be touched unless it is absolutely essential minimal manipulation should be done in the post operative period and finally one should be ready for a long journey to manage the changing refractive errors the visual access opacification and amblyopia during the long term follow ups the media for this presentation was from my recent textbook on pediatric cataract published by springer singapore i thank you all for a patient hearing greetings to everybody Thank you, Siddharth, for a very comprehensive overview of the practical tips. It is a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sumita Agarkar. She is Deputy Director, Pediatric Ophthalmology, Shankar Netrale, Chennai, India. I invite you to give your presentation on management of posterior capsule in children. Dr. Sumita, please. Good evening. I'm Dr. Smita Agarkar. I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist from Shankar Netrale, Chennai. I'm going to speak on management of posterior capsule in children. We need to manage posterior capsule. Mm -hmm. Few months or few weeks of surgery, a uh, beautifully done cataract surgery can be undone by visual access opacification or posterior capsular uh, opacification. Literature reports PCO rate to be close to 100% in children and probably is 100% in younger children. Visual access opacification not only interferes with visual rehabilitation, but also can lead to deprivation amblyopia, more so in 
So posterior capsular management can be done as a part of primary surgery by doing a posterior capsulotomy. It can be done later using a YAG laser or sometimes as a secondary surgery like a membranectomy or capsulotomy under general anesthesia later on. So primary posterior capsulotomy is usually initiated at the end of cortical aspiration. It can be done either before or after IOL implantation. Instrumentation can be usually either a microcapsule of forceps or a vitrectomy cutter. Ideal size of a PPC it should be a millimeter less than anterior capsulotomy, which should be around 4 to 4.5 millimeter, which ensures a clear visual access. And it is useful to consider doing PPC even in older children who have nystagmus or who have traumatic cataracts or UVID cataracts because posterior capsule opacification in these children can be often thick and fibrotic and difficult to open using a laser. So this is a small video as after the lens aspiration has been done, a small nick is made in the center of the posterior capsule and using the same principles of anterior capsulotomy, uh, directing the forces to forceps towards the center at all times, uh, re-grasping the capsular flap, uh, PPC is done. Sometimes PPC may have to be done after the placing the IOL as you can see in this child with the uh, traumatic cataract and there is a capsular, uh, there is a corneal scar which interferes with the visibility. So I have decided to place the IOL first and now you, I'm introducing a vitrector under the IOL and I'm cutting the capsule to do a posterior capsulotomy. Uh, fluids uh, should be placed over the IOL and cutter beneath that ensures that there is no hydration of the vitreous and uh, there is no excessive prolapsing of vitreous into the anterior chamber. And as you can see that it is, it is possible to do uh, with a uh, after placing the IUL safely. However, this may be a little difficult to do in children in which there is an in the bag IUL placement uh, because in very young children because the, there may not be enough space for you to lift the IUL and put the cutter behind the IUL. Uh, always ensure that there is no vitreous in the anterior chamber at the end of the vitreous. Sometimes there can be a very thick fibrotic membrane. As you can see in this patient, there is only a thick capsular vascularized membrane in the posterior capsule, which uh, you need you sometimes you may need to cauterize these vessels to, to ensure adequate opening. And then there has to be a substantial opening which can be sometimes difficult to do it with a cutter and you may have to use intraocular scissors like these and you make radial cuts in the thick capsule and then you can use a vitrector to trim these edges which ensures that you have an adequate fairly large opening and of course you have to ensure that vitrectomy is done adequately so that there is no traction or no now some pearls regarding posterior capsulotomy Using a 100% retroillumination if your microscope offers that facility is always a good idea. It helps you to see the flap better against the red fundal glow. Tearing forces should always be directed towards the center. And it is not a good idea to deepen the anterior chamber too much. A good viscoelastic will always help in this. Uh, calcified fibrous posterior capsules have lesser risk of extension and these probably you can use a vitrector more safely uh, to cut a posterior capsular opening and always be prepared for some surprises like uh, pre-existing dehiscence uh, in especially in children with unilateral So as I said earlier in this I am using only a retroillumination and as you can see that flap is much easier to see uh, against the red fundal glow and you can see it as it is tearing. My force of tearing is always towards the center and you have to grasp and re-grasp the flap several times during the capsulotomy to ensure that the, it, there is no extension. 
and then of course this has to be combined with vitrectomy again pearls of vitrectomy they use the highest cut rate which is offered by your machine and probably ensure that vitrectomy is complete one end point of vitrectomy is that as you are going with the fluid is on there should not be any distortion like here now uh, while doing while we drawing the probe at the end of the complete vitrectomy so you should pause in between keep the fluid on and see as as i paused here and you can see there is no distortion of my posterior capsule anterior capsule or iris as i am withdrawing the vitrector so this probably is your end point of uh, vitrectomy uh, without any complication as i mentioned earlier surprises this i was a little bit prepared because you can see that there is a pre existing dehiscence uh, with the central dense cataract and there is some tailing of uh, cortical matter behind the lens on a on slit lamp but even if there is a posterior capsular dehiscence it is possible to do a safely uh, cataract surgery with uh, vitrectomy and several of these capsular openings uh, despite having a dehiscence are fairly stable enough to place a iol if you can ensure a good vitrectomy and good stable iol implantation so in this patient i can i was able to place the lens in the back despite having a fairly large size rent in the center but as you can see these are my rent is actually bigger than my anterior capsular edge but it is stable so i was able to place a single piece iol in the lens in the back now vitrectomy is a little bit controversial but it is probably mandatory in children who are younger than 5 years as an intact hyoid can act like a scaffold for lens epithelial cells to grow and cause visual axis opacification it can be deferred in older children or only a ppc can be done in older children it can be deferred if you are using a special designed lens like a bag in the lens or if you are planning to do an optic capture highest cut rate offered by vitrectomy machine should be used to minimize traction on the vitreous and anterior vitrectomy does not necessarily increase the risk of rd substantially laser coprostomy should be reserved for older cooperative children and you can do a u shape or a circular opening it's a good idea to start with lower energy first and then increase the energy it is difficult to laser fibrosed capsule seen typically in inflammatory or traumatic cataracts and laser capsulotomy does carry a small risk of retinal detachment in myopic children and this must be explained to the patients before you do the so sometimes we have done uh, capsulotomy uh, uh, using in children using a general anesthesia but as you can see this picture it looks scary and it is a definitely a risk uh, uh, and probably should be avoided secondary surgeries are the most frequent second procedure uh, in infants following cataract surgery to clear the visual axis and other indications could be uh, of requiring a second surgery is failed laser or thickly fibrotic capsules again sometimes anterior capsule can become five five most and may require surgery both anterior and post planar routes are acceptable and anterior route however i must say may not be feasible if the lens is securely in the bag and it may not provide enough space for you to introduce your caps uh, vitrectomy probe under the capsule in every every situation in that case probably it's best to use a pass planar route uh, clear the uh, this is a small video again here you can see my anterior capsular margin is completely five 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 most into a small opening and there is a thick plaque which is right in the center allowing obscuration of the visual axis and sometimes it's not easy to even use the scissors to cut these kind of plaques and sometimes you may have to use a plaque as well as uh, you may have to use a vitrector as well as scissors to kind of detach the plaques as i'm doing here and then completing it with a uh, vitrectomy cutter
so now it is probably possible to have some traction to get a vitreotomy cutter here and cut that remaining fibrous capsule. So this is all I have to say about Thank this. You for your attention. It's a great pleasure now to welcome uh, Dr. Ed Wilson uh, from Storm Eye Institute in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I'm sure he's well known to, to most of you. Uh, Ed's going to give us uh, the benefit of his wisdom on secondary intraocular lens placement in children in the bag or in the ciliary sulcus. Thank you, Ed. Um, greetings, everyone. This is uh, Ed Wilson. My topic uh, in this webinar is secondary IOL placement in the bag or in the ciliary sulcus. Now, I'm going to begin by taking a, a little step back. This is an article representative of the era in February of 1997 um, by Al Biglin and Ken Chang and, and others uh, in Pittsburgh. And they um, report on 28 eyes of 25 patients who had a secondary intraocular lens. In 20 eyes, the lens was the lens was placed in the ciliary sulcus. In the other eight, it had insufficient capsular support even for ciliary sulcus. So two were placed in the anterior chamber and six were sewn to the sclera. Now, just two years later in 1999, we published in the bag secondary intraocular lens implantation in children. Now, I think what had happened was back in the earlier era, it was common to remove nearly all the capsular bag. Uh, in uh, Al Biglin's article, he describes that most surgeons were leaving a two millimeter rim if they were leaving anything at all. And gradually we began leaving more capsule um, that did create a larger somring ring but it also created the opportunity to place the lens within the capsular bag. Here's the diagram from that 1999 article describing opening the uh, donut, if you will, and um, creating uh, a new anterior capsular edge, uh, removing the uh, reproliferated cortex and uh, um, uh, recapturing the capsular bag for an implantation. And we've since um, refined the technique a bit and reported on, uh, on larger and larger series of cases. So here's just a representative example. And I, I have um, three short videos that uh, um, were just recent. Uh, these were uh, edited just this week. Um, and they, uh, they just show the variety of what we're, what we're seeing. So this is a four-year-old child, and what you can see is I am finding a place where the somring ring is, um, is thick enough that I can make an opening with an MVR blade, and I'm sure that I'm, I'm, I'm just, just above the white ring, I'm opening the anterior leaflet of the capsule and not the posterior leaflet. And then my preferred technique is to place the 25 gauge vitrector. I place it with the cutting port slightly turned to the side, and then I enter that space made by the MVR blade, and I work my way around the circle 360 degrees, um, being careful to open um, the somring ring and have, create a new anterior capsule opening um, and not disturb the posterior capsule. Now, the reproliferated lens cortex in that somring ring, um, it's thicker the younger you operate on the, on the children, and it is what is holding the space and allowing you to, um, uh, to make this, this opening. Now, once the uh, Somring ring is open 360 degrees, and here I've switched to my left hand to make that last 
uh, quadrant easier. Uh, then I, my next task is um, again using the vitrector, but I use it on aspirate mode, and then I just meticulously clean all the lens material out of the capsule bag. Uh, it's important if you see the opportunity to place a secondary lens in the bag that once you open it that uh, you debulk all this material and try to keep it, uh, try to clean out that reproliferated cortex as much as possible. Uh, here I'm even using the um, irrigating cannula to hold back the iris in certain quadrants and just trying to, to be uh, to be meticulous about cleaning it. Once I'm satisfied that the uh, that it's been cleaned out, uh, then I can carefully put my um, OVD, my viscoelastic uh, material, uh, in a way. Here's here's the the um, OVD going in, and uh, I push down slightly. On the posterior capsule, make sure that I'm lifting my new anterior capsule up toward the iris. And so, if I can visualize that well, which I usually can, even in this eye where the pupil didn't dilate uh, uh, too well, um, then I'm creating a separation between the posterior capsule and the, and the new newly created anterior capsule, so that um, I can aim this lens directly into the capsular bag. Now one of the advantages of going to this much effort is that then I can use uh, my preferred um, in the bag intraocular lens rather than having to resort to a, um, uh, a lens that I would use in the sorry sulcus. So this is a single piece hydrophobic acrylic lens and it is appropriate only for in the bag haptic fixation. So um, this has allowed me to use to use my favorite lens rather than um, uh, a different uh, lens or a three-piece lens. I'm rotating the optic because I like to remove the uh, ophthalmic viscosurgical device um, from both anterior of the lens and also under the lens and I don't want a haptic in the way. So here with the, with the vitrector, I've got it on aspirate at the moment, then I'm just um, aspirating all the OVD from anterior to the lens. And then you'll see that I'm also um, putting the, uh, the haptic, putting the um, vitrector under the optic uh, without engaging the haptic. And then I'm removing uh, any residual vitreous and any um, OVD that's underneath there. And then you can see that I'm recentering the lens. Now I've got another, here's another uh, um, example. This is a 10 year old girl. Uh, again, her pupil didn't dilate very well on the um, on the affected side. Um, so here I, making sure that there were no sneakia, if they were, break the sneakia, usually with visco dissection. And I chose to use iris hooks because I wanted to really see um, what I was doing. And it's, it's, it's invaluable sometimes in these cases. So now I'm, I've made my MVR cut, I'm doing my vitrector um, you can see that I'm making an opening in the Sommering ring and then carefully cleaning it um, and not damaging the posterior capsule or my newly created anterior capsule um, leaflet. Once I've got everything clean and there's no residual reproliferated cortex, then I'm placing my um, viscoelastic, my OVD, uh, to lift up the anterior capsule, create some separation, and again, I'm able to use an in-the-bag implantation for, um, for this case. Um, 
You just have to be really careful as the lens goes in, make sure it's in the right spot and, and it doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't become half in and half out of the bag. So now I'm satisfied. I've rotated the lens just like in the last case, got it all situated. And, uh, and then I'll remove the OVD and last, after I sew the wound, I'll remove the, um, the iris hooks. And here I'm removing OVD. I would just emphasize that a case like this, that Sommering ring was so bulky that I'm just not sure that placing a lens on top of it in the Solari sulcus would center that well. Um, it just really looks like that was, was lumpy and might need to be debulked, even if you weren't planning on putting the lens uh, in the capsular bag. Now, not all cases have um, uh, an appropriate amount of capsule or Sommering ring to, um, to place in the bag. Now here is another case. It happened to be done on the same day as that previous case. I am um, breaking Senechia. I don't see uh, a huge amount of capsule. I studied this um, child at the slit lamp. Um, I didn't do the original surgery, so I'm not completely sure um, what's there, but now I'm seeing capsule all the way around. Here I'm having to make a judgment call. Is uh, So that's pretty far out there and it's gonna be difficult, even if I put iris hooks in, it'd be difficult to um, dissect that open. So I'm making a judgment. If that rim is, is it sufficient to hold a lens or do I need to support the lens some other way? The second judgment is, um, is it flat enough, not really so lumpy, that the sulcus is an appropriate place? And I, I came to the conclusion that a sulcus fixation was fine. Um, in these cases, I, in the old days, would use a PMMA lens because it was nice and, nice and uh, uh, stiff. Uh, since the rim is not all that wide, these days, since I don't have access to um, the single piece PMMA lenses, I use a Rainer. This is a hydrophilic acrylic. It's the only single piece lens that I'll put in the sulcus, but it does work really well uh, in, the, in the sulcus in these cases. So in conclusion, look for an opportunity to reopen the capsule bag and place the IOL within the capsule leaflets. In the bag placement better assures centration of the intraocular lens and allows the use of IOLs that are designed only for capsule fixation and prepare for the secondary IOL placement when performing the initial lensectomy. And I thank you for, for your attention and I look forward to questions. Thank you, Dr. Wilson, for uh, lovely videos and uh, a very good insight into the placement of secondary IOLs. With pleasure, I introduce Dr. Sudarshan Khokar. He's a professor at RP Center, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. And I invite you, Dr. Khokar, to speak on pediatric cataract surgery in large and small eyes. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on which part of the world you're sitting in. I'd like to thank the organizers to give me the opportunity to interact with you on these abnormal eyes, smaller eyes or larger eyes. So large eye, when I say it means a buphthalmic eye, which is having a glaucoma, and the glaucoma colleague will refer to you before or after the trabeculectomy. The other subset is a megalocornia or a normal big eye. They are normal, but they might have luxation since the bag gets stretched and the zonules break off, the, these lenses might behave something like a spherophagic lenses. A single piece in the bag might not be a good idea in these ones because the bag sometimes is about a 13 to 14 millimeter and the single piece lens is about a 12.5 millimeter across. So the best is to do the capture of a three piece lens or iris claw fixation, which I'll be showing in the videos.
the first video now you see this is a big huge eye it's about a 16 millimeter across you can see the entire lens the pupil is well dilated if you think the rex is looking small it's a mistake because the optical illusion the eye is big the, the size of the rex is 5 millimeter aspiration of the cortex can easily be done using biomanual and once that is done you can do a posterior excess. Again, you find the tissue is so lax, a nick from the side and coming with the intraventral forceps and going all around, you can create a good posterior excess. Vitreous is usually fluid in these patients because of the enlargement of the globe. The three-piece lens is being put in, it lens is put into the sulcus and then it's pushed back behind the posterior capsule so that the anterior posterior capsule fuse and reduce the chance of ear formation and that's what it looks like at the end. Now that's the second patient in which there's a megalocornia, the eye is big and there's a plaque on the anterior capsule. This eye is 25 millimeter each size, excellent that is, and white to white is about 12.5. This is a megalocornia eye with the anterior capsule of plaque. So how do you go about the surgery in this one? UVM shows uh, swollen up lens and anterior capsule of plaque. You make incisions with the stab of the MVR. I always make two 180 degree apart on the fibrotic plaque and using the scissor and the forceps, I cut it on 360 degree. Cortical aspiration can easily be done by using biomanual. You see the anterior capsule is not cut properly superiorly. So once I'm doing a vitrectomy, at that time, I'll just trim it to the desired size. Then I enlarge the section to 3.2 as it's a three-piece lens. The lens goes in the sulcus and it's captured. The trick to capture here is to put one optic under, push the lens to, towards inside and then allow the other one. Otherwise, you might just rip the interior fibrosis here. The third case in this series of big eyes is a patient in which if you notice on the UVM it's a 14 millimeter across diameter white to white. The iris is so floppy. It's like a spherophagic eye is trying to push anterior and zonules are all stretched. So what do you do in these patients? You do a lensectomy in these patients and once you've done a lensectomy and a little vitrectomy, then you plan the iris claw lens in these patients. I made two side ports. Those side ports I made on the side are to help me to enclave the lens. You see, once the lens is put at the pre-designed place where it's going to be parked eventually, I go behind and tuck in. You see, you can see the impression so well. So the trick is to hold the lens firmly in the center, which I'm doing right now. And once you are holding it well, a little nudge superiorly under the iris will give you the impression and you can nudge the lens in. And that's how it goes in and goes in very well. Okay, now coming to the smaller eyes. Now, since these are smaller eyes, we're not putting implant in these eyes. We can do the surgery simultaneously, meaning in the same GA time, you can finish both the eyes. So, you can have two sets of instruments. You can wash between two cases, or you can have two sets of surgeons. One gets up and the second takes off for the other eye. Totally washed and draped again. So, what you need to do is you need to have two small incisions with the MVR, and you need to go with a cutter probe. Initially, with the eye cut probe or a cut eye probe, depending on what step you're doing, is a fast surgery. And retinal evaluation is must in these eyes, but these are smaller eyes. So retina might show you a surprise. I'll show you some of those retinal pictures in these uh, videos next. I'm showing when to show you. Measurement of the eye is a must. You can do the caliper measurement, and if you can, if you have a UVM, I think it goes a big way because every time the patient comes to me, I keep repeating UVM at six months. I can actually see the dimension of these eyes, how they're growing, not only on the surface but inside also. Okay, so this is what a small eye looks like. You measure with the caliper, and but UVM still, I think, is a good standard according to me, and you can actually measure things uh, very well on these ones. Now, this is one of the surgeries in which I'm going to be performing an anterior capsule rexis. So I come with a side port, I use a long intravitreal forceps, and I stain the capsule and go all around and do a rexis. All the pupil look small, but the merexis is about a 3.5 to 4 millimeter. Now, at this stage, when I come with a cutter, I'll go under the iris and cut a little more so that even if it contracts, it doesn't come to the pupil margin. 
and then a PI is done in, and this one gets over. Now second is an eye with a microconia and a congenital cataract. You see the axial length is 16 millimeter. That is very small eye and the white to white is eight millimeter, both eyes. And this is what the UBM picture is. So we are doing UBM in all the patients actually. So we make two side ports. Going with my cutter inside, I'm using my cut eye right now and I turn myself upside down and open the anterior capsule. And once the anterior capsule open, the, the cortex will start coming into your tip. So that's the time you stop your uh, cutting and you turn into a eye cut mode like a biomanual without coming out of the eye. Then you go all around and try to take the cortex. At this stage, a beginner should flip over his hands and come from the other side to uh, aspirate the cortex. But if you see what I'm doing, I'm pulling the cortex out and, out and I'm using the left hand, other hand to support it. So you can use a technique. Now again, you see there's a five millimeter ring which is on the top. And my anterior opening and posterior opening is about five millimeter. And that's where I'm going to leave after my technique. And of course, I'll do a small PI. But before that, I'll put a wide angle on the surface and I use an illuminator and I take the picture like this. Now you see this is a hypopigmented retina. This patient turned out to be albinino. He had albinism and that's what it looks like. And a PI can be done easily from the side port and that's what it looks like. PI is normally cut done with a, using eye cut mode and the moment the suction comes in, the flutter of the pupil, you, that tells you that the PI has happened. Now, Coming to the third group, which I thought I'll skip, but since I have a time, I'll cover it up. ROP, retinopathy of prematurity. Uh, about 10 to 15 patients have been operated by us in the last few years. And this girl is five months old. With a history of laser and intravitreal injection in this one. And so there was an opening in the posterior capsule. So we have published some work initially in, in 2019 and 2016 about the same. This is how you go about in surgeries in these patients. Okay, so you see the central part, which is hardened, and if you do UVM, you can easily pick up an opening here. So you are careful, and on a gonio, you always do a gonio in these patients, and you can see the gonio sinica in here. Make two side ports. I'm making a third side port because I plan to put a lens in this patient. Because the other eye was a clearer lens, so you have to rehabilitate this patient eventually. Coming for the side port, you, I come for the side port and give a vertical neck downwards from the center, lift up the capsule a bit, and I leave it there. And now I come from the main incision. My main incision is a little bigger than the side port, so that my forceps, which is the intravertebral forceps, which goes in smoothly and does not get stuck. All the surgeons get stuck if the incision is small, the, the knuckle of the intravertebral forceps gets stuck. But if your incision is big, which anyway you have to enlarge later on to put the eye with, once you've done a minim minimal hydration, then you go with the cutter, with the eye cut, you can actually aspirate the cortex and you can see the central opening looking at you. Go all around, take out the cortex. And in this case, because it was done a month after the intravitreal, the, there was no fibrosis of the posterior capsule. So I could convert the posterior opening into a perfectly round CCC. The trick here is not to overfill the bag. I filled the chamber, anterior chamber, but not the bag. So you go there, hold, lift it up and go all around. You have to have a good anesthesia team and uh, the, the kid should be a little deep anesthesia at this stage. We don't want any optimal movement and that's how it happens. Again, there'll be some pockets of the fluid inside the vitreous because the vitreous has been given. And you see, I will go with the wide angle again with my ELU and you can see the pigmentation of the retina and the retinal laser all 360 degree all around. This was a 1.2 incision, it goes to 2.2 and the lens, a single piece goes into the bag. And once the lens is in, you aspirate and put a suture. And there's a trick to check the wound. If your bubble is not expanding the chamber, that means your side ports are good. And you're good to go. That's how the eye looks good. Okay, so the challenges we faced in this one, they're small eyes with the low square rigidity, the liquefied pockets in the vitreous, due to intravitreal injections which are given and the laser also. P 
PC defect can be seen if you, if you, get, if you have the patient coming early to you with a, without a fibrosis or the PC defect, you can actually convert it to CCC as if nothing has happened and you can go ahead with the surgery. And thank you very much. And for any further information, suggestions, and devices, you can contact me on this email. Thank you very much. It's now a great pleasure to um, introduce Jan Chir de Faber, who's known to many of you who are members of IPOSC. Uh, Jan works in Rotterdam Eye Hospital in the Netherlands and is going to talk about cataract in PHPV, PFV, primary uh, fetal vasculature or persistent fetal vasculature rather, surgery or not. Thank you, Jan. Dear friends, uh, I would like uh, to uh, tell you something about cataract in uh, PHPP, PHPP, PFV uh, cases uh, to do surgery or not. I have no financial disclosures. Um, these are the top seven indications for pediatric anterior segment surgeries in my career. And uh, as you can see, uh, over more than 2,000 uh, cases, uh, uh, 112 cases were PHPV, uh, in which uh, 85 uh, eyes were operated. <laughs> Uh, there was an excellent uh, 54th Edward uh, Jackson Memorial Lecture in 1997, where Goldberg first coined the uh, term of persistent fetal vasculature, and uh, uh, an article uh, in that same year came out where this was very nice depicted. Um, the uh, <clears throat> Persistent fetal uh, uh, fetal vessels are here shown in uh, in an uh, in a pathology uh, specimen in which you see in number one uh, those are the hairpin loops and uh, uh, at three you see uh, where the um, hyaluronic R three uh, comes from the um, um, optic nerve uh, which is called Bergmeister papillae. Uh, several specimens uh, are known in the uh, in the uh, literature, and I always explain to the parents uh, that uh, the uh, PFV is actually uh, the umbilical cord of the eye, which uh, can, uh, if it doesn't regress normally, can cause cataracts. Here you see from the uh, from Goldberg a uh, very nice. Uh, picture where you see a severe case, a moderate case, and a mild case. Uh, a mild case sometimes doesn't need to be uh, operated on because it's uh, not visually disturbing. In severe cases, uh, other uh, complications can um, occur. Uh, one thing, uh, uh, one symptom you uh, can really uh, detect whether it's a PHPV um, case or not is when you see uh, a cataract with an abnormal vasculature in the anterior chamber. These are the uh, so-called hairpin loops, which come from the uh, vitreous, run around the lens and then into the <coughs> anterior iris, into the uh, um, angle uh, chamber angle. <coughs> Ultrasounds will really help you because uh, sometimes these are uh, mature cataracts and then uh, you can uh, detect with ultrasound uh, whether there is a PHPV or not. Some cases uh, don't need surgery if there is only a very small uh, uh, cataract uh, in, in the two uh, pixels above, which I borrowed from uh, David Taylor's textbook. Um, you see that uh, the patient can actually see around it. And in the uh, lower uh, left um, corner, you see 
that uh, it's so severely damaged uh, the posterior uh, uh, the, the posterior part of the eye that there is no uh, visual acuity to gain. Um, you can do this surgery with uh, an anterior approach. Make sure that you uh, detect uh, uh, or uh, dissect uh, the uh, cataract and also uh, all remaining fibrous tissue from the uh, ciliary uh, body, and that you uh, cauterize the uh, uh, the persistent uh, hyaloid artery with uh, endocauterization and remove everything. Because if you don't remove everything, you can get uh, a reclosure, of which I have also some examples. Uh, sometimes it's better to go for the uh, parsplana approach, especially if there are large vessels, because once you cut uh, the, um, the um, persistent uh, patent uh, hyaluric uh, R3, then uh, pulsating uh, arterial uh, blood flow uh, blood flow will uh, fill the eye. And if you're not uh, uh, able to do a full vitrectomy and uh, cauterization of that blood vessel, uh, uh, you can't see anything anymore. Complications post-operative are closure of the, uh, of the pupil, regrowth of the uh, plaque, uh, bombing eye width with angle closure, glaucoma, uh, retinal detachment, uh, vitreous and uh, anterior uh, chamber bleedings and, and ophthalmitis. And then uh, you see here a special case uh, with a pseudo-Peters uh, anomaly. The, uh, the iris and part of the lens is attached to the um, endothelium. You can uh, Siever that uh, bluntly with uh, viscoelastic uh, material and uh, using iris hooks, you get uh, a better uh, exposure of uh, the lens and the uh, posterior plaque. Uh, this is also uh, called uh, here uh, by Goldberg as a Peters anomaly, but I think it's a pseudo Peters anomaly because uh, it has. Uh, no <clears throat> uh, uh, damage to the uh, decimate membrane. Uh, the uh, cloudy central cornea will clear up in weeks uh, by endothelial uh, cell reshuffling. And uh, if you see a case like that, always look for the hairpin vessels uh, uh, and also ultrasound can have the giveaway of uh, persistent uh, fetal uh, vasculature and uh, no uh, lens capsules are uh, adherent. Here you see uh, a, a, a case uh, which I showed you the videos of, and here you see how you can uh, see for bluntly with viscoelastic uh, material the um, uh, the um, iris and uh, and uh, from the endothelium, uh, and uh, uh, then use iris hooks to. Um, to do the uh, uh, vitrectomy, uh, take the lens out and make sure that you clear uh, everything of the uh, of the ciliary body because otherwise you get, will get a, a reclosure. And this is uh, um, about ten years ago when we had uh, different uh, vitrectomes. Nowadays we have twenty three gauge and. Um, <clears throat> 23 gauge and uh, vitrectomes, uh, and, and um, which makes it uh, a lot easier. And this can uh, be very calcified uh, material. This is an, uh, the end result. Um, <clears throat> here again in, uh, in, in, in nicer slides. Uh, so make sure that you uh, clear uh, the whole ciliary body. This is the same patient four weeks post-op with an AFAP contact lens in metriasis. In 85 <coughs> uh, surgeries, uh, I lost uh, two eyes, um, seven uh, bulbous intact, uh, but are blind uh, uh, due to um, foveal hypoplasia in these eyes. Uh, the visual acuity can range from uh, light perception to sometimes 0.8 uh, uh, and, and I have one or two eyes which uh, had 20 20 uh, uh, vision and in eight eyes uh, I needed to do a second surgery within three months. 
So uh, one of the complications is reclosure of the PHPV. Uh, you see an example of this, which was a referred uh, reclosure to me. Uh, endostomitis uh, occurred in one of my uh, patients and uh, uh, using uh, interocular uh, antibiotics is uh, really necessary in these uh, delicate eyes. In conclusion, <clears throat> do PHPV uh, surgery when there is a high risk of complications complications uh, are expected due to the natural cause of uh, this progressive disease. These, uh, some of these eyes can uh, have a very uh, narrow anterior chamber and will progress to phthisis. Uh, or if there's a good chance of uh, uh, visual uh, improvement, give the parents good information of the prognosis, um, patching contact lens and uh, uh, IOL later. I use then the artisan uh, uh, lens because there's no capsule left. There's a chance of more uh, surgeries and the risk of complications in uh, uh, like retinal detachment and glaucoma. Uh, also in uh, in the zoo, I had a bilateral case with the uh, uh, with a wallaby, uh, very small eyes, and here you see the ultrasounds, which looks very similar to uh, human eyes. Um, to finish, what is the right attitude for a pediatric eye surgeon? Uh, upper left, you see, uh, you have always be very positive and pleasing to uh, to the little patients, uh, but you have to be uh, very uh, scrutinizing uh, for your own uh, data, as you can see in the upper left, and uh, a combination of that will uh, will. Uh, will enable you to pull the pediatric uh, uh, ophthalmology card with success. I thank you for your um, attention. Thank you, Dr. Faber, for taking us into the complexities of uh, these complex patients. Our last speaker, Hello, Dr. Soon Faik Chi from Singapore. She is a very talented uh, cataract surgeon. She speaks to us on uh, cataract surgery in subluxated lenses. Dr. Chi. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for including me, and I'll be speaking on management of the pediatric subluxated lens. These are my financial disclosures with no relevance to my talk today. The causes of congenital lens dislocation include isolated ocular disease, which may be simple ectopia lentis, which tends to dislocate in the superior temporal direction, or ectopia lentis at pupillae, where the lens and the pupil are displaced in opposite directions. Or there may be systemic associations, the commonest being Marfan syndrome, where the lens shifts superior nasally, homocysteinuria where it moves inferiorly or nasally, microsphere where it dislocates superior temporally, inferior nasally or inferiorly, and there are a whole host of other associations. There are many challenges managing the pediatric subluxated lens. Firstly, timing of surgery. Surgery should be done when vision is no longer adequately corrected by spectacles or when the lens equator bisects the visual axis. Surgery is urgent when the lens is subluxated into the anterior chamber or posteriorly into the vitreous cavity. Generally, we prefer to use monofocal intraocular lens implants and consider the use of toric lenses where appropriate. In the near future, we may be using more enhanced depth of field implants. There is no clear superiority of one technique over the other. We may wish to discard the capsular bag and implant an anterior chamber intraocular lens, iris enclavated lens, or do scleral fixation of the lens with or without sutures. Alternatively, we may wish to preserve the capsular bag and implant a posterior chamber intraocular lens and also capsular tension ring, capsular tension segment where appropriate. And we may also choose to use a femtosecond laser for the capsulotomy. I'm going to start by showing you an iris enclavated lens. So we are preparing the scleral tunnel 5.4 mm incision size. Next, we do capsulorexis, and I'm not too concerned about the shape nor the size because we will sacrifice the bag. After supporting the lens bag with hooks, we do a lens aspiration and then a vitrectomy to clear the vitreous just behind the capsular bag and also remove the bag. And this uh, is assisted by staining the vitreous with 50 
50% diluted tramsilone acetonide. We next inject myostat to constrict the pupil, and this is the lens that we flip such a concave surface is forwards, insert into the anterior chamber with in the horizontal meridian, and you can see the horizontal meridian are marked. And then using enclavation needle, uh, we then push a tuft of the iris through the claw to enclavate the lens, and it's helpful to lift this lens forward so that we can see where that enclavation clip is. And importantly, we then need to do peripheral iridectomies, which is done with the help of the vitrector. Now, this patient with Marfan syndrome, uh, we are initiating the capsorexis and tearing this time without the need of support. And the shape of the capsorexis should be the shape of the lens. We then support the capsular bag with uh, capsule retractors that support the equator of the lens bag. And you can see the plane dissected again uh, cleanly by this viscoelastic into the subcapsular space, and once we apply traction to these hooks, they then expand the bag to the um, normal position so that after doing lens aspiration, we can then insert a Sioni 1L um, capsular tension ring, which is modified with a suturable eyelet. We then remove this um, support because I'm worried that it, I may have threaded the ring through the wedge of the support. Now, this next patient has a lens dipping into the vitreous cavity. This patient is isolated microspherophakia, and I've just harpooned the lens with a 27 gauge needle and brought it to the anatomical position and doing bimanual capsorexis again and using an iris hook to support the capsule rim as I tear, looking at the equator for guidance for the shape and the size. You can see as we add more supports, um, we can then complete the capsule rexis. It's difficult when you do not know where the center of the lens is and retracting the iris helps us to know. And once we've supported the, the lens bag, I'm preparing the suture snare by preloading a 27, 26 gauge needle with a segment of the Scotex 7 o suture. I apply a capsule tension segment, the capsule tension ring in the subcapsular space, another segment support them, aspirate the lens, and then we're going to implant the intraocular lens into this bag and marking 1.75 mm posterior to the limbus is to show you the dissection of the Hoffman pocket half scleral thickness using the suture snare, extend a loop of the suture, as you can see here, out through the main incision, and then bring in a suture through that loop of extended suture to lasso this end of the suture bearing the capsule tension segment so that we can bring it to the scleral fixation point, 1.75 mm posterior to the limbus, and then retrieving the sutures from the Hoffman pocket, we then apply a 211 knot adjusting the tension to center this intraocular lens. We ensure that the knot is well buried. This two year old has a traumatic subluxated cataract. I initiate capsulorexis with the 27 gauge needle, then do an interior capsulorexis with the micro forceps. And as I'm tearing, you'll see pseudoelasticity displayed here. And I insert a capsule retractor in order to provide the counterforce as I continue my capsule rexis. And you'll see this is much easier and smoother. But when I come around where there are no zonules to provide the counterforce, you will see that this is again difficult to perform. And I should have used bimanual capsule rexis here. Yeah, I was a little lazy and just tore on and you'll see this capsule rexis tending to run out. And at this point, I bring on a second micro faucet to provide the counter force and complete the capsule rexis safely, although it was a little larger than intended. I then support the equator of the lens with capsule retractors and do lens aspiration. And when I come out of the anterior chamber, I inject dispersive viscoelastic to maintain the anterior chamber space. I then create a Hoffman pocket half scleral thickness 1.75 mm posterior to the limbus and then load a capsule tension segment with Cortex 7O, insert it into the capsular bag where the zonules are missing and I create a suture snare using uh, 
26-gauge needle loaded with the cortex suture, extend a loop of the suture and lasso the free end of the suture loaded on the tension segment and bring it to the scleral fixation point. I repeat this uh, step with the other end of the suture and both sutures are then brought to the sclera. I puncture the posterior capsule now with a 27 gauge needle and do a posterior capsule rexis. You can see the posterior capsule is really elastic and as I pull the capsule tension flipped out of the capsule bag and I managed to reposition it, put two throws to apply some tension as I insert the intraocular lens into the capsular bag and then finalize my knot with two further throws to center the intraocular lens and then remove viscoelastic. This patient with microspherophakia was done with femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery. We are first scanning the capsular bag and then downsizing the capsulotomy to 4 mm. And you can see that the capsulotomy is done in less than two seconds. As microspherophakia, after doing the capsulotomy with the femtosecond laser, I then remove the capsule, checking for the integrity of the capsulotomy. And this area here was a little uncertain, so I used a second instrument to help to remove the capsule and found it was intact. I then provide supports by inserting capsule retractors just under the capsule and then insert a capsule tension ring into the similar space. And I did not provide the counter traction on this other side here because uh, I was uncertain of the integrity. And then the rest of the surgery involves inserting two capsule tension segments and fixation after our L insertion. This is Kana Brava's technique using 6O polypropylene suture threaded through a 27 gauge needle. Introduce 2 mm posterior to the limbus. As the needle comes through, we retrieve the suture through the main incision, thread it through the eyelet of a capsule tension segment, flange it with thermal cautery, and then insert it into the capsular bag. We then tighten the suture and repeat this for a diametrically opposite location. It's important to ensure that the flange is large enough so that it does not slip through the eyelid. So once we have the two sepsis-centered segments in the bag, we then tighten the sutures to center the intraocular lens, cut off some of the suture, leaving 3 mm, flange it down, repeat this for the opposite site, and push the flange through the conjunctiva and the scleral tunnel. Now this is to show you a patient where the lens is subluxated into the vitreous cavity. We are now marking diametrically opposite uh, positions, 2 mm posterior to the limbus, and then we are going to remove next the lens uh, with vitrectomy through a pass planar approach, do a peripheral iridectomy, and then inject a dispersive viscoelastic into the anterior chamber, insert a three-piece intraocular lens into the anterior chamber, and then we're going to use 27 gauge needles that are bent, and we move from 2 mm away from that predestined mark and insert a, through a scleral tunnel into the eye and thread the one haptic into the bore of this 27 gauge needle. We repeat the same for the diametrically opposite point, ensuring that we are entering the eye at the marked um, position and then again threading this haptic into the bore of the 27 gauge needle. We retrieve the two ends uh, of the haptics uh, by pulling simultaneously, remove the needle, flange the haptic as uh, it comes through. And uh, once we ensure that the lens is well centered, uh, we then can push this back into the scleral tunnel. In conclusion, the pearls for managing pediatric subluxated lenses include use by manual capsule rexes or iris hooks for severe zonalysis to provide counter-traction. The shape of the capsule rexes should follow the lens shape. Use capsule retractors or capsule tension segment for equatorial bag support. Delay placement of the capsule tension ring, but in severe cases, place before lens aspiration. Use Gotex 7 o suture, which has great longevity. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you to all our speakers for some fabulous uh, presentations. Vanita, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. The, um, the talks have stimulated a number of questions, um, and I think we've got some time to address some of them and, and to uh, ask our panel to respond. Um, we've got a number of questions to um, Professor Wilson. Um, I'll ask him in the first instance. Um, uh, Jasper Ites has asked, uh, why not perform an optic capture rather than trying to open the bag with all its different secondary implantation? Uh, yes, I can. I can answer that. I mean, m most of the time, the um, the white ring is firm, and it's not usually an appropriate size for a capture. And with all the lumpiness of the um, uh, of some of these Somring ring, uh, it it would be difficult. You'd be capturing through, and then your your um, your haptics would be riding up over this uh, this lumpy Somring ring. So I've I've not. I've not done that. I think you, you could debulk. You could debulk the, uh, the 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 ring and then use capture if you choose. Yeah, I'd I'd certainly agree with that, Ed. And I've done that. I've debulked in some cases, but but like you, I think it's great if you can remove the summer rings ring. It gives you so much more space, and you're then not going to be causing iris traction, uh, iris trauma from the haptics. Um, right. Chris, may I, um, uh, may I uh, comment on that? Of course. This is Jan de Faber from uh, the Netherlands. Um, uh, um, in, in former days, uh, when we had these stiff PMMA uh, lenses, uh, three p uh, uh, single piece, we could, uh, uh, they were stiff enough to put on, uh, on a bulky uh, um, summer rings ring. But uh, when we then uh, got uh, seven, uh, sorry, uh, uh, three piece uh, uh, IOLs, uh, then when that, uh, uh, and, and put it in the sulcus, uh, then when the, uh, the uh, summer rings ring would increase, then you get the, uh, the optic capture in the pupil. And so that really uh, was helpful, uh, the work of Ed Wilson to debulk the, uh, the submarine ring because uh, we don't have any more uh, the stiff PMMA uh, lenses. So that, that really helped me because I learned it the hard way that if you simply put a three, three piece PMMA, a three piece uh, um, uh, a, a lens with uh, proline uh, haptics into the sulcus. Uh, as in some of these children, this optic uh, will be pushed through the pupil. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to ask Dr. Wilson, some of these children, by the time when they have had surgeries very early, say four months, five months of age, when they are older, a lot of time the bag has kind of shrunk and uh, it is not, it looks like a very small bag. So in that case, would he still go and open the bag or would you uh, put it, uh, would you rather prefer to put it in the sulcus? Because sometimes the bag, there is the elongation of the zonules and bag is actually smaller than, even though corneal diameter and anterior uh, segment parameters look normal, but I, bag I, I think yeah, it's a judgment call. I mean, you do sometimes with a very early lens removal, if the bag stays uh, at infant size or microphthalmic size, then you may not want to chance it. Um, if it's still lumpy, you can debulk it, and then you can put a lens in the sulcus. So I, I think it's a case-by-case -case sort of thing. I wanted to also add, if, if you're we showed cases of where there's lots of cortical material keeping that capsular equator open. If there's much less of it, I do sometimes make a little nick in the anterior capsule and then take the viscoelastic cannula and you can open it up. You can make the viscoelastic track 360 degrees and bulk up your, your ring, give you more space to work. Uh, if the cortex provides that, great. If it doesn't, you can you can actually fill it up a little bit with viscoelastic and make it easier to work in. 
sometimes capsules, both the anterior capsules stick together and they become like one fibrous membrane. Yeah, uh, then, you put, then you put the lens in the sulcus. <laughs> excellent videos. Thank you. We've got uh, a number. Ed, can I ask Ed, Ed a question, please? Sure. Well, I was going to alternate to keep uh, different speakers uh, busy, okay. if that's okay, and we can come back to Ed. Sure. Um, there are a number of questions for Dr. Chi um, with some, you know, very impressive, uh, technically very adept videos. I would, I would, would be my comment on that. Um, one of them from, again, from Jasper, Dr. Chi, what is your take on anterior iris claw lens in Marfans, as there is not much endothelial loss? I might disagree with that point, but in posterior iris claw, if it disenclaves, it can fall back into the retina. Secondly, Marfan's is a progressive disease with continuous scleral thinning. Would you prefer scleral fixated or iris claw in them? So Dr. Chi, I wonder if you'd like to respond to that. Thank you for your question. Um, generally, my preference is not to use iris claw lenses. Uh, firstly, we have to open up the incision to 5.4 mm, use the scleral approach for these lenses. I've also seen the claws disengage and it's not quite that easy to retrieve the lens from uh, a tilted lens from through the pupil to re enclavate although it is possible. And there's a trick to doing that, that is by using a micro forceps to grasp the intact claw through the iris and then levitate that. But it's not the simplest thing to do. And we are putting them in children, and I have seen, you know, this these this enclavate in adults. So I would be really quite concerned about putting it in children, and definitely not in the anterior chamber because I think the endothelial cell loss is higher when it's placed uh, closer to the endothelium. Um, with regard to fixing to uh, the sclera, generally, if we can preserve the capsular bag. I would preserve the capsular bag so that everything, the, the lens is placed in the anatomical position and that um, we use the um, Sioni uh, rings or the capsular tension segments to suture to the sclera. And of course, I favor the use of Hoffman pockets because we preserve the conjunctiva for these children who may develop glaucoma over the long term. And also they may have retinal detachments as well. And so generally I do not, um, fix with a Yamani fixation unless I have no choice because a Yamani fixation is only used in the absence of capsular support. So generally, I favor preserving the capsular bag in patients with dislocated lenses, no matter how severe. If I can preserve the bag, I rather use the capsular bag to contain the lens within the capsular bag and then fix that to the sclera. Especially in Marfan syndrome, the sclera can be very, very thin and um, the scleral rigidity is poor. And even with cortex sutures, I've had some you know, of the uh, fluid leak out of the eye through these cortex tracts. So I think Marfan syndrome, it's, um, they, they can be quite difficult to handle and we need to be extremely careful. Sometimes I've had to put glue within the Hoffman pocket just to ensure that these eyes are well sealed so that they don't have any post-operative hypotony. My, um, I would just like to follow that on as chair, but I'm um, old enough to have been around a long time. And um, my concern with these very impressive techniques is the long-term complications. And I know that Ed Buckley gave a, a really superb talk on this um, at APOS about 10 years ago um, and showed that there was a significant risk of um, lens dislocation, this intraocular lens dislocation uh, of vitreous hemorrhage, of retinal detachment. And these are often complex eyes with comorbidity, uh, co-pathology. And I'm just very cautious about doing what are in undoubtedly impressive techniques, um, but without um, the guarantee to parents and to the child themselves that there will be long-term stability and security. Um, you know, we're looking after these kids for a long time. And um, that's, that's my only concern here. And, and I think therefore, very 
careful informed consent is very important in these cases because I, I, I would guess you don't have very long follow up on your series. Well, Gothic Sutures, actually, I think it was started a long time ago in the US for at least 10 years. And Gothic has excellent longevity. It's a 7 0 suture. So it really handles um, very well. It's like a rope, it's really very, very thick. And this has been used for cardiovascular work in pediatric uh, patients and also in orthopedic work. So this actually has an excellent track record. Not in the eye, it doesn't. Um, in the eye, it's about 10 years. Uh, when Robert Sioni started to use this, it's 10 years. Mm. But it's um, off-label use in the US. Yeah, I think uh, I'm just, I'm deliberately playing devil's advocate here, but I just think you need to be very careful with your consent um, because it, it, it doesn't, you know, orthopedic use and vascular use is very different to the eye. And the eye in a young child who is likely to be jumping on trampolines and, uh, you know, playing rough games is, uh, is a very, it's a very vulnerable organ. And also we yeah. know that the nylon sutures that we used before all degrade with time. The, the body attacks them and they break down. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on that. I'm, I'm dominating things. Yes. Just, uh, well, Chris, I, I think uh, uh, I have to uh, agree that uh, uh, that we don't know how long uh, these uh, these children have to uh, to live for another eighty years. What will happen in in in, in eighty years? Uh, and so I think you have a have a point there. I have an, another comment on the uh, artisan uh, iris claw lens. If you put them uh, on the posterior um, uh, side of, uh, uh, of the iris, so retrofixation, you have to flip the, uh, the uh, IOL upside down because it's, uh, it's in the anterior ch uh, chamber is uh, 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 concave. And so you have to, in order to get a good uh, uh, fixation uh, in the posterior part, you have to uh, put it uh, upside down. And some people don't know that. Um, Vanita, I don't know if you've got any comments to make so far. Just last comment. In case, in case, in fact, if you put it upside down, you're going to be causing an optic capture there. And once you put a retrofixation, in fact, you can get away with the PI because since the convexity is posteriorly, the pupil never get captured with the retrofixation. I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Can I uh, raise a question to the panelists uh, and the experts here? And uh, my uh, concern has all So you see, there have been lots of issues and uh, um, one uh, uh, hypothesis that I came across was that formula of seven, that younger the child will be, our desired, uh, desired refraction post-operatively is higher. And uh, by the time the child is 10, we could uh, leave him with a, at an emetropic status. Uh, what is the uh, general consensus? Doctor, could we begin with Dr. Kokhar? Of course. See, uh, we recently did a study in which you found that the Indian I, eyes just, are I not... begin with Dr. Kokar because he is dealing with the type of patients that we are dealing probably. That is why I asked him to. I think nobody will mind. Do you want to take it first? It's okay with me. Oh, oh. Perfect, yes. Okay. So uh, we've been doing lots of work on this for the last 20, 25 years. And we realized that uh, when you're following the PROST and the Hunt formula, the patients were still staying hyperopic and they were not getting into the into the zone where we wanted them to be the sweet spot, like uh, when they're 15, 16, they should be emetropic. So they were still hypertropic to the extent that they were plus four, plus five, which was bothering us. So we started calculating backwards. We took up a work in which we took patients in four categories, this is six months, six months to one year, one year to two years, and two years and above. So we followed each of this group for six months to see what was the a change in the exit and how refractive error, the status was changing, and how was the emetropization was taking place. And we were surprised that the Indian eyes were smaller eyes and they were not growing as, as much as the Western eyes. So what we realized was that we came up with a formula in which for five years old, 
we do 2% under correction. For two years, we do 5%, whereas the older formulas were about 10% for two years. So between one to two years, 10% is absolutely fine. And when you come less than one year, divide into again two groups, six months and above and six months and less. Six months and above, we still got everything right. We, we are getting around plus minus two diapers, which is pretty good for these eyes. Whereas less than, that, that is about 15% we do between six months to 10 years. Uh, to one year, six, six months to one year. But less than that, it has to be very high. And we put less than that only if it's a unilateral patient and we are sure that the patient is not going to use contact lenses. Otherwise, we put them on contact lenses and once they're about one year and a half and the eyes are grown, we uh, put the lenses. So the formula is that to undercorrect all these patients, but how much will depend on each eye. And when to put the lens is the second thing which people are always bothered about. The thing is, it's not the age of the patient, it's the size of the eye and the health of the eye. If the eye size is anything more than 9.5, 10 millimeter across white to white. I'll put an implant in these ones because that works the best in, in our setup because patients don't use contact lenses. Second, if the excellence is less than, say, about less than 17, 17.5, uh, then again, the we are putting in implants because the lens are not available for that. If it's 16 and below, the lens will be about a 44, 45, and we don't have those bars available. So those are the patients which should love to leave them effective. And when they grow up, if they grow up and the eyes grows up, then we can put them in that. Um, um, sorry, sorry, Ed, you good. go ahead. Go ahead. Um, well, I, I, the first thing I would say is that not all three years, not all three-year-olds are alike, not all five-year-olds are alike. So using an age and as the as the only determinant uh, seems flawed i mean it's it's a guess but um yeah. so we we created a formula at least it works for two age two and above based on real data it's a multiple regression formula that will predict in an individual eye what the axial length will be at any age so we usually say let's let's use the formula to predict the axial length in this age at, at this child at age 20. And then you can decide what you want at age 20. You want emetropy at age 20, minus one, minus two at age 20. Um, and at least for eyes two and above, it works pretty well. And the most important things are whether the eye is small or large for that age. So you, you plug in the exact age, yes. you, plug in, you plug in the current axial length, and some other parameters, and it will predict, we're now creating an app for it, but it, it's a, it, it was in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, AJO in 2019, but it's a good way to at least give you a prediction so you know in that eye um, whether, where it's gonna go. Yeah, but it, you can never be sure and still, because you'll still have outliers. I mean, sure, it'll work. Yes, sure. Yeah. but it's better <laughs> than just using the age. True, true, that's true. I agree. Fully agree with you. I would, I would agree with Dr. Kokar just that cataract is not a diagnosis. I know that's something that I keep saying, but that's why I'm very interested in cataract genetics. And there are, yeah. you, know, you, will, you will get eyes that do not behave in a predictable way because they have a very different genetic basis to the other uh, eyes that you're dealing with. So, and in the same way, PFV eyes and Down's eyes don't behave in a predictable manner. Um, so it's, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, the, the kids with straightforward crystalline mutations may well follow Ed's formula beautifully, I think, but, but if beware of the ones that have an unusual syndrome. Um, <coughs> while we've got time, we'll have a look at some of the other questions. Um, Jeff Woodruff has said, thank you for the excellent presentations and videos. Um, what is the first maneuver for a small pupil? And if you use intracameral adrenaline or phenylephrine, what dose do you use? So I'll pass on to the panel. Um, Dr. Singh, would you like to respond to that one? The, uh, for a small pupil, or the pupil which is diminishing in, uh, in size per operatively, the uh, first maneuver I think uh, would be to use uh, adrenaline, diluted adrenaline 1%. And if that works, fine, we can go ahead. Otherwise we prefer to use the iris hooks. 
Dr. Chi, how would you respond to that? Got still muted. This reflects. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Generally, for pediatric eyes, I use iris folks. And of course, if that's sinica, we can use, depending on the extent, we can use just a viscoelastic cannula to sweep and a coagulant hook to push and pull to release a sinica. And I always remove the membranes that bind the pupil down. Yes, uh, using the, um, uh, the uh, I forget the name, you, using that uh, uh, thing spatula. to go below the iris also helps at times. Spatula, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. And these eyes should be atropinized preoperatively, even if they are not uh, responsive initially. But once you do a little bit of sinicolysis, then they respond quite well intraoperatively if they have been atropinized preoperatively. Yeah. Uh, publication of using a combination of both uh, uh, mediatic as well as uh, uh, anesthetic, which is commercially available. And uh, that can be given intracamerally. And uh, at least the paper which is coming from BGI Chandigarh uh, claims very good dilatation uh, in the dilatation throughout the surgery without any need for drops. Uh, my, I don't have any personal experience. But uh, Dr. Jaspreet, who was there, have, has written and they have played good results and sustained dilatation through the, through the surgery. Yeah, I mean, in the US, we call that sugar cane. It's um, uh, the doctor who did it maybe 20 years ago was Dr. Sugar, S-H, not S-U-G-E-R. <laughs> Um, Sugarcane uh, is used by all of our adult colleagues in my institute, but if the pupil is, has an abnormal fibrotic um, uh, musculature, it's not going to respond. It, mm -hmm. It's beautiful for a no drop technique in a normal pupil. You can put it in and instantaneously get a big pupil and they, they do that. That's, that's our routine in adults at our, at our place. In fact, uh, if you're putting the iris hooks in these, sorry. If you're putting iris hooks in these patients, you've got to be careful because the cul de sac is too small. So your, the upper and lower leg might be hitting. So you have to position yep. them so well, like uh, the Ed, Ed showed in one of the videos, five, five uh, iris hooks report. So you have to have an orientation which is correct. So you don't touch the lid mark, and otherwise uh, it's not going to work well. In, in Rotterdam, we use um, uh, epinephrine, 2.5%, uh, uh, mm -hmm. and four drops diluted in one millimeter. Uh, BSS and uh, most of these uh, pediatric uh, pupils will respond on the needle uh, mm -hmm. or on the cannula. And, uh, and uh, uh, I also uh, concur with, uh, 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 with my colleagues that uh, if you use iris hooks, be careful because uh, uh, and, and, uh, a neonate uh, um, iris can respond with uh, 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 with a fibrotic reaction because you are, uh, 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 well, actually my message is only use them when you really need them. Yeah, yeah I'd agree with that. Anybody putting in um, the Malugan ring? I haven't. In I haven't. In, you know, in older, in older kids, the smaller version and the Malugan 2 is a little bit easier to use than the, than the first iteration, but they're not very good for kids. I mean, you know, maybe a teenager is sort of like an adult, but they're not very good for young kids. Too traumatic. They're too bulky. Yeah, too bulky. Any, any experiences with the small sphincterotomies in desperate cases? Sometimes they work. Sometimes they close back up. I mean, in a really desperate situation, sometimes you just have to trim the iris with the vitrector because it's all fibrotic and the little, the little cuts are not enough. I hate to do that, but sometimes it works yeah, really well. I, I didn't want to say that, but since Ed has mentioned it, there are lots of patients with, they come with a stuck down pupil, which is about one, 1. 1.5 millimeters. So whatever you do, you're gonna cause the damage. So what you need to do is, as Ed mentioned, you go with the vitrectomy probe with a high cut rate, just close to the margin and just go all around. The thing is, they're stuck up downwards. So once you go a millimeter away from the lip, from the from the sinicia, it actually opens up beautifully well and gives you about a three millimeter pupil. Yes, but the sector is gone there. True. I hate to do that, as I also said so. But yeah, in some patients, you have to do it. I mean, 
especially the microthalamic smaller eyes, in which you just, just can't do much in those ones. I think we've got, I'm not sure how much longer we've got, um, but um, I think it was an hour and a half originally. Perhaps, have we got another five minutes? Please. Yeah, if that's okay, we'll, we'll probably do one more topic and then we'll probably have to sign out, I think. Um, here's a good one. Um, how do you manage myopic progression in pseudophagic eyes in kids? And this is a good one to feed into Dr. Wilson while we've got him, I think. <laughs> Ed, how would you respond to that? I mean, how do I deal with a myopic progression? I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I point out to people that when, when you remove the lens uh, in a child's eye, you remove the offset uh, to axial growth. So you're gonna get a myopic shift. And, um, and, and so you know, we, we manage it by um, leaving the eye hyperopic initially, if we can, uh, if the child won't wear glasses, I'll leave them emetropic. I'm doing a lot more um, IOL exchanges these days when they get to be almost full grown. And we're all learning how to do those because we, we created that, that high myopia. Um, I, I don't know, what, what else do you think they, they meant by that question? Well, I know that um, you know, it feeds into the, um, the growing area of managing myopic progression in kids anyway, but, but I wondered whether you wanted to talk a bit about the use of piggyback lenses and so on. Um, yes, I mean, I think that's one, one option. Um, the reason I don't do piggybacks as often as I used to is because I'm, I'm a bit more comfortable now with IOL exchanges. I think that initially we thought that once you put a lens in the bag, it was going to be so difficult to get that lens out of the bag that when a child would not wear glasses or contact, we would pick the uh, in the bag permanent lens, thinking that we would leave it alone forever and then put a, a smaller power piggyback in the sulcus on top of the bag because that was an easy place to remove the lens once, uh, once it had enough growth. And that's a safe approach. I just don't do it as often as, as I used to. I just put a higher power implant and plan on exchanging it later. But I think it's, you know, if people choose that, you, you often are putting a, you know, a 22 in the bag and an eight in the sulcus or something like that and, and removing it later. Uh, I would like to add that once the child reaches adolescence, it makes sense to put in a piggyback lens at that time. We have a right. lens, uh, the, the trade name, I would not like to say, but it's a lens which can be placed in the sulcus and it's specifically made for pseudophagic people who have a residual refractive error or a myopia, which can be well corrected by placing the implant in the sulcus. Yeah, I think I think the um, the those lenses that uh, I know what you mean, and and then they're they're not available in the U.S. Um, the, the ones I'm thinking of made in made in London, uh, made in England, and um, that's a good option. Even an ICL might be a good option. I just I've seen some articles on it. I just don't have any experience with it. But you certainly can put some myopic correction on top of the implant, or you can do LASIK if it's a small amount. Most of these high myopes are beyond the 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 LASIK capability. Just remember to put iridot, iridectomy when we are putting in a IOL in the sulcus. So I've had some experience uh, with sulcoflex lenses from Rainer. Right, right. And That's also the add-on yeah. lens Those are the ones. Yeah, from already human already. optics. But this is mainly an adult. And I think uh, what usually bothers me is the presence of a somering ring. Because as you mentioned in your talk, it can be kind of lumpy. So if you do a UBM before the surgery, uh, you need to be prepared to take out the Somrings ring. Otherwise, the sulcoflex will not sit properly because they also have a, a toric correction in these lenses. So sometimes if you want to place it in a particular position, although you leave it there in surgery, at the end when you see the patient post-operatively, because of the presence of the Somring ring, uh, which is not in the area where the haptic is, it's in between the haptics and the capsular bag, the, the lens will tend to slide back to a particular position. And I've had to suture uh, even a sulcoflex that Rayna makes to the iris to prevent it from rotating. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, they're nice to do, they're simple, but the outcomes may not always be as planned. Yeah. 
my take is if my myopia is more than six, then that's my cutoff. Then I actually go and exchange these implants. I, I, I agree with uh, Ed fully that it's very easy to take these lenses out, especially even in the bag for there for three, four years, you can easily dial these lenses out and you can change and put a fresh lens with a new bar. Any experience with uh, Dr. Chi with the sulcoflex lenses, the membrane developing between the two lenses? Uh, no, because uh, that usually happens when both lenses are made of um, um, hydrophobic acrylic. So you get like a, a rock-like membrane in between. Because the uh, add-on lenses actually are very, very thin and they are also uh, convex, like a contact lens. So they will actually into the space sulcus very easily. Whereas when we are talking about the interlenticular membrane, you're talking about biconvex lenses that would be inherent in the center. Yeah, so these don't develop membranes between the lenses. And interlenticular yeah. opacification was reported for, for bag bag piggyback. So it doesn't occur with bag sulcus. Uh, it occurs with bag bag. And, and so it is, you know, when we do piggybacks in kids, the permanent lens is in the bag, the temporary lens is in the sulcus. That avoids, we, we never, never seen an interlenticular opacification with that. I, I had a three year old who had a very thick membrane between the two lenses. The one lens was in the bag, there was a sulcoflex lens, and there was repeated membranes. So finally, I had to remove that. Done elsewhere, I have not done the surgery. So after that, I'm a little wary of circumflex over there on the no, bag. No, but uh, Svita, when you're putting a circumflex, you're putting a convex lens over a, a, a convex and a convex. They both are, uh, you know, they're fitting into each other. What was the red rock syndrome basically was uh, described by John Stewart from Australia, red rock syndrome. He had two convex surfaces hitting each other and it used to go like a moss on the rock, lower rock and upper rock. So they were both convex surfaces facing each other. That is what he classically described with the membrane growing over. But with this uh, silicone lens in the front and uh, a different material at the back, uh, it's not that common. But if you had it, uh, you should look into the inflammation if the patient had small pupil or to touch the pupil. Yeah, he should have been a year yeah. old and uh, had repeated yeah. doubts. So. Yeah, other factors, yeah, true. After removing the cellcoplex, now he is plus 10 and I have... <laughs> so you exchange this lens to the... <laughs> Yeah, that I mean, might have been an inflammatory membrane and not not really a, yeah. a true yeah, interlenticular membrane. It was not. It was, not, it was, it was a fibrotic membrane. And I, he had already had two membranectomies before he came to me. And there was okay. again fully opacified membrane in between the two lenses. So I Spita, anyway, this, yeah. practice so Spita, your, patient, your patient is plus 10. It's not minus it's not a myopix, it's a plus 10. So I no, think it's just not, not to I do a uh, double lens for plus lenses. First. Yeah. yeah, yeah. he had okay. surgery first, then there was a DBR surprise, then right. there was a less placed, and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, then, at this point, I think I'm getting messages that um, we've run 20 minutes over. It's been a brilliant session, and I'd like to thank everybody that's contributed. It's been really fascinating. And thank you for giving us your time and your expertise. Um, so um, I'll call a halt to the webinar, if that's OK. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Lloyd. Uh, I will go to introduce our next webinar. So uh, let me share the screen now. Uh, so uh, I, I think all of us will enjoy this webinar and agree that today's webinar is, uh, is excellent and we all learn a lot. And in our coming iPods, Join webinar, uh, we will join with KPOS, the Chinese Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. And the webinar will be on October 29th, a Friday, uh, on 5.30 a.m. EDT. And uh, this time we have the moderator of uh, uh, Gaten Fasen Now Cell Loads from Brazil and uh, Chen Zhao from China. And we have six speakers. Uh, Dr. Tian from China on finding the critical period of myopia, Ian Morgan on educational change to prevent onset myopia, and uh, Yu Pin Li from China on vitamin D and myopia, and Professor Wu Pei Chang on outdoor and public health intervention of myopia, 
Professor Ho Ming Huang on the FDM based practice for myopia control. And he myself will talk about low concentration atropine drop for myopia control. And I hope all our audience will also join this webinar for the, to learn about uh, myopia control. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, thank you once again, Professor Chris Loy and also Professor Renata Singh and also all our star speaker. We all enjoy a lot. And uh, so uh, let's conclude today's uh, webinar. Thank you so I much. I would like to thank we take everybody a group photo. For, we can take for this excellent webinar. Can yes. we take a group yeah. photo, please? Yes. Uh, so uh, please, uh, we all stay uh, up here and then we want to have a group picture uh, together with uh, Dan, Michael, and also Farouk. Can we have a group picture together?